So welcome everyone to this edition of um, Verifiability Talk, the first talk in, in the new year. So happy new year to you all. Um, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Gabriela Lakatos, uh, who will also present jointly with uh, Hugo Araujo. Uh, Gabriela is a lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, she comes very, with a very diverse background. Uh, she has done biology and ethology before and then moved to human-robot interaction where she currently focuses and she has also a very long-standing experience with Casper robot, uh, the robot that uh, she will be presenting uh, today and then talk about um, its uh, very good use in in, uh, in education for children with special needs. So Gabriela, it's an honor to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for inviting me for this talk. Um, it's really my pleasure. And um, as, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on uh, how Caspar can be used for children in special with special educational needs. And um, so if uh, time allows us, I'm going to uh, try and present two different studies, uh, one that focuses on um, our work with children with autism and another one which uh, was done with children with learning disabilities. Uh, it's a very recent study. So the first one um, is the Casper Explains study which uh, was uh, supported by the Task Hub and the verifiability node and was done in collaboration uh, with uh, with uh, Mohamed and uh, Hugo and you know uh, King's College London. And this study was about um, assessing added value of explanation uh, in interactions of children with autism and assistive technology, more specifically CASPAR. Uh, so it's um, it's important because uh, you know autism spectrum disorder is a long-term developmental disorder that affects uh, people's and children's not only children's but people's perception of the world and how they interact with each other and um, with other human beings in in uh, general and it. Uh, character it's characterized by really high well wide it's you know it's a very wide range but it's always characterized with interpersonal interactions and interpersonal skills as well as with repetitive actions and um, some constrained behaviors and um, it is it has been found that an early diagnosis allow in, in children allows a wide range of support that uh, can help children in their developmental years and one of the most recent techniques to support children with autism spectrum disorder is uh, robot assisted therapy uh, which has been used recently uh, because interaction with social robots can be uh, used as a as a, a mediator between uh, children with autism and adults, or also between in, in child and child interactions. And they can um, help children to learn about social interactions, about even emotional expressions in a less challenging way. So even though it can seem really contradictory to use robots for teaching children about social interactions and human social interactions, uh, it really uh, has been proved to be very um, useful recently and uh, sorry it was my email I should have turned it off so um, and it it is um, useful for I mean ro robot assisted therapy and robots teaching children human social interactions prove to be uh, useful because they they are less challenging for the children to understand interactions with robots compared to an interaction with uh, with a human person. Also robots are more predictable for children and the interactions themselves, uh, you know, interventions themselves are more controllable and adaptable to a specific child's needs and uh, their particular pace and style of interaction. So uh, we have used the Caspar robot for several years now um, for um, therapy for children with autism. And this robot uh, actually specifically has been developed uh, for children with autism and to provide uh, therapy for children with autism. Uh, so this is why it has been already developed with relatively simplistic features and expressions, because the simpler the features are, the easier for the children with autistic uh, spectrum disorder to understand those expressions. And so then they can also learn about and rec generalize from what they've learned with Caspar and recognize those emotions and facial expressions on hu humans and their parents, for example, as well. 
This robot has a childlike appearance. It's about 56 centimeters tall, um, has 22 degrees of freedom, and uh, has several different um, sensors, for example, RFID sensors or F uh, FSR sensors. Um, and it has been used since 2005 uh, in various settings. Um, it's been out in uh, clinical settings, in hospitals, different countries also like Macedonia or Greece, Australia. Uh, it has been used in uh, school environments by teachers as well as in home environment by parents. And different case studies in the past have proved that um, Caspar can help children to learn about turn-taking skills, social interaction skills, recognizing emotions, imitation, collaborative skills, and also various cognitive skills such as visual perspective taking which is also um, the scale that our current study was focusing on. So uh, visual perspective taking is a skill which has various levels, uh, but basically it's the ability to understand that other people have a different line of sight to ourselves. And uh, a higher level of this skill is to understand that two people viewing the same item from different points of view may see different things. So if you consider a cube which has different pictures or numbers, on its uh, sides. If uh, we look at it from different perspectives, we will see a different number or a different picture on the same cube. So uh, children with autism often struggle with understanding uh, this, uh, you know, that, that you may have different line of sight or a different view. From different viewpoint, you may see different things. They, they uh, often don't develop uh, the visual perspective taking skills or only later. So uh, our idea here was that uh, also based on a previous um, uh, Horizon 2020 project that Caspar uh, providing uh, explicit causal explanations might be able to help these children to develop and improve their visual perspective taking skills. And so uh, in this uh, in this uh, specific project, we wanted to uh, design a causal uh, explanation engine uh, and build it, uh, you know, with the with the help of uh, King's College London and and uh, implement it into the Caspar robot and see whether children exposed to the causal explanations will make uh, less visual perspective taking mistakes over time. So first, as a first step uh, in this uh, project, we started with a retrospective study in which we analyzed previously existing in, uh, videos, 34 videos of different interactions between Caspar and children with autistic spectrum disorder to identify what kind of scenarios are the ones that elicit um, um, really high number of explanations that could be used in this study. So um, we took videos from this Horizon 2020 project, which was called a baby robot that was also related to visual perspective taking and children with autism. And, um, and uh, by going through these videos, we identified uh, behavioral patterns and, and scenarios that might elicit these causal explanations. For example, one scenario was when Kaspar said to the child, please show me a, a pig, which was a plush toy at the time. And then when the child got that uh, plush toy and try to, you know, lift it up in front of Kaspar's eyes. If Kaspar uh, uh, if the child, for example, had the pig too low, then uh, the researcher at the time said, Kaspar cannot see it because you are holding it too low. So we took these scenarios and uh, redesigned the games so that Kaspar could provide these explanations. So uh, we developed four different games. I'm not going to show all of them, just uh, to as an example, uh, the first game was based on the previous scenario, which I just mentioned. It was called Show Me the Animal Game. And you can see a um, picture of the setup. So the child basically was sitting next to the researcher facing Kaspar. And uh, there were six plush, uh, well, in this case, because of COVID, not plush toys, but pictures of animals around the room. And then the ch uh, Kaspar asked the child uh, to show a specific picture of an animal, to locate it in the room and present it, it to Kaspar in front of Kaspar's eyes. And then when it was done correctly, Kaspar said, well done, I can see the certain animal. And as a reward, made the sound of that animal. Uh, if the child held the, the, the picture of the animal in correctly for some reason, you know, in not, not in the right 
orientation, for example, or too, too much to the left, too much uh, to the right, or too high. Then Kaspar explained that the object was not in the right position. And uh, as a second uh, level visual perspective taking skill uh, scenario, we also use the cube, uh, which you can see has different pictures at different sides of it. So in this uh, in this game, the game was basically the same, but in the but this time, the Caspar asked the child to hold the cube that has a picture of an animal uh, to to hold the cube in a way that it shows a certain animal to Caspar. So, for example, please show me the cat on the cube. Uh, when the child held the cube correctly, then again Caspar said, well done, I can see it, um, and made the sound of that animal, or if the child held the cube incorrectly, then the, the robot explained that the object is either not in the right position or not in the right orientation. So, uh, based on the four different games that we uh, identified and developed in this scenario, 16 explanations have been uh, created. And um, as a first step, these explanations were um, uh, evaluated in an initial survey. Uh, this was a video survey in which 20 adult participants took part. None of them had autism, autistic uh, spectrum disorder. And they watched an explanation. Uh, they watched and evaluated the explanations through a video recordings of a res researcher interacting with the robot and receiving the explanations. So I'm going to show you um, an example of how it looked like. I hope the sound works from the video as well. I don't think we can hear the sound, but. No. Sometimes uh, ch changing the noise cancellation effects on, on Teams helps, but. I can also just narrate. So uh, if I repeat the video, so. Kaspar says, please show me the tiger. This is a scenario where. Oops, sorry. So this is a this is a scenario where um, where the researcher is asked to move Kaspar's head to show a certain animal. So Kaspar asks, please show me the tiger and please move my head so I can see the tiger. That's when the, the that's when the researcher will move Kaspar's head. Then Kaspar says, I cannot see the animal because my head is too far left. Oops, sorry. So this was an example of one explanation. And then um, the participants had to evaluate these explanations that they were watching through the videos uh, using the explanation satis satisfaction scale that was based on um, specific features uh, key features of uh, explanations such as understandability, sufficiency of detail, completeness, accuracy, trustworthiness, usefulness, and so on. So uh, you can see every single um, questions that uh, the participants had to uh, respond to in this table here. Um, and uh, based on the results of this survey, we found that the 16 explanations that were created um, based on these four games to be used and implemented into the causal explanation engine were um, uh, satisfactory and uh, beneficial because to, to relate cause and effect because they were rated as useful, understandable, uh, accurate, satisfying, uh, detailed and complete. And um, so, um, as I mentioned, it, this study was done in collaboration with King, King's College uh, London, and the main aim of this was also to mechanize the strategy to at automatically generate causal explanations that are provided by Caspar, because uh, up until now we have always used wizard of all settings with Caspar. Um, so I'm going to give the floor to Hugo to explain how this part was done. Um. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so the this part of this project we managed to publish on a conference on social robotics um, recently. Um, and the main goal was to show that we generating cause explanations we can use um, and apply it to Casper robots. We can enrich interactions between children and Casper and promote 
trusting the robot. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So the Casper robot in the cause in the scenarios have been explained. So I'm going to give a brief explanation of the causality part of it. Um, so the theories behind is by, the one by Halpern and Pearl. Um, the even his their theories they have several versions. Um, we use a version that's based on counterfactuals uh, and parallel worlds, meaning that you basically build a different world than the reality, and then you try to analyze whether to find a cause for an effect, you build a parallel world and then try to see whether making changes and, um, and applying um, interventions can result in a different effect. Um, so this requires a mathematical model, which is called causal model, um, that has variables, the equations that dictate how the variables behave, and has a state space that dictates how uh, the values that the variables can, can obtain. So with this model, uh, which has variables, equations, and state base, uh, you can try and analyze uh, causality, which are given in the shape or in the form of uh, Boolean predicates, both the cause and the effect. So we have this toy example here where we have two people, both Susie and Billy, and they're throwing rocks at a bottle. Um, so if when Susie throws a rock, uh, this hot rock hits the bottle and the bottle shatters. Uh, similarly, if Billy throws the rock, uh, uh, his rock is going to hit the bottle and the bottle shatters. So, for example, we could try and ana analyze what, uh, uh, what is the cause for the bottle bottle shattering. Um, if, let's say, that is true, that becomes true in a causal model, you could potentially try to anal analyze whether the cause is because Susie threw the rock or because um, Billy threw the rock, and then you give in a series of clause uh that are part of the the, the definition of the, are part of the theory uh you can say for example that susie throwing the rock is the cause for the bottle sh shattering or billy throwing the rock is the cause of the bottle shattering um and that is a brief brief explanation of the actual causality uh if you go to the next slide please and gabriel Sorry, I think my connection, my my internet connection is probably a bit slow. I just heard to go to the next slide and I went, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure how much I'm delayed. Um, so the games are the ones that have been mentioned by this by Gabriella uh, recently. Um, so the and the potential, the 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 idea is to, to try to um, have a measure of the potential of the children to be aware of a, a third party POV. In that case, is the Casper robots. Um, and there are some deterrents, uh, for example, blindfolds, wall, sleep, uh, and the four games are the ones that have been mentioned. Uh, something else is that the picture can be too far, the picture can be rotated, or the cube can be rotated or out of view. And this would be the, basically um, almost like the requirements of the system we're going to model. And uh, in the interaction of the four games as well, they are dictated by the, the specifications that have been uh, explained by uh, Gabriella recently. So we take the theory by uh, by causality by Halpern and Pearl, and we take these interactive games and we build the causal model, which is explained in the next slide um, for for this for the games. Yeah. Uh, so here we have several variables, and they have uh, they can assume different, uh, multiple values each. Uh, for example, you can say that your children animal is correct or wrong, because for example, if you tell the child to pick the the a picture of the lion and the child picks the picture of uh, the elephant, then uh, the chosen, chosen animal would be wrong, considered wrong. Um, and this is the this is the case for every variable in this system uh, here. And the effects we are trying to evaluate are the two variables at, at the very bottom. Uh, we evaluate whether Casper can see at all and whether Casper can see the chosen animal. Um, sorry. Uh, Gaspar can see the chosen animal would be the effect that we are trying to, to evaluate. Um, and that depends on the other variables. Um, as you can see in this causal network, which is the picture on the right side of the, the image of the slide, uh, you can see that how each variable uh, is dependent upon uh, the other variables. So this is called causal network, uh, which is a dependency network between the variables. Uh, I didn't uh, put the equations uh, in the slides, but basically they're just a combination of booleans, uh, true or false, or, or, or for example, uh, in order for the Casper to see, to be able to see, 
uh, Kaspar needs to be awake and the eyes need to be clear and the view needs to be clear as well, meaning there's no obstructions, there's no blindfolds or there's no walls. And that's how Kaspar can see. Uh, it be, this can be equal to true. And Kaspar can only see the chosen animal if the chosen animal is the, is the correct one, is in the correct rotation, correct height, distance and position as well. And Kaspar can see. And that would be how the, we model this uh, system. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Please. Uh, and then we built a an interface uh, between Caspa and our cause analysis, where the explanations are sorry the 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 world is built by the researcher, which selects uh, what is going on uh, during the, the experiment, and this is in turn is given uh, via a JSON file to our cause analysis uh, process in engine, uh, which generate the causal model analysis, build the causal model, model uh, generate the, the, perform the causal analysis, and evaluate whether the effect uh, is true or not. In case the effect is true, meaning the Casper can see and Casper can see the chosen animal, we don't need a cause. Otherwise, we determine the cause based on our cause analysis and return to the the. The, the, the ranked causes to the um, to the person doing the experiments to the researcher um, via JSON file as well. So we implemented this uh, within the Casper code uh, in order to to conduct this experiment, and that is the um, summary of the causal analysis in the Casper project. Thank you. So uh, once, thank you very much, Hugo. So once, uh, once the causal engine was implemented in Caspar, uh, we have run an experimental evaluation uh, with uh, ten children uh, who all came from the same same uh, special needs academy, and we used an ABABAB design to assess the interaction, which meant that um, the letter A means a control condition which didn't have any explanation, and uh, B means um, uh, session where Kaspar was providing explanations. So um, it meant that basically every participant uh, participated in each game with both uh, explanations and without explanations. Half of the children uh, received uh, two sessions without explanations and the other half of the children received two sessions with explanations. Um, but each child participated in, in all four games and uh, repeated the sessions three times. Uh, then we measured the number of uh, correct actions and also the number of incorrect ac actions and um, we compared them uh, and we analyzed them um, uh, com uh, compared to the number of their total actions. But first of all, I'm, and, and before I show you the results, I'm also, I also would like to show you a video of uh, how children behaved in the first and the second session. But for this, we would really need the voice. I think. So, in, in my experience, if you just can um, turn off the, the noise cancellation in your device settings, uh, it typically when you play on the uh, uh, let me see. So it's called noise suppression uh, in device setting. Uh, one to the last or two to the last uh, item. If you change from auto to off and then yeah. you play. Yeah, Maybe. Uh, are you playing? Uh, no, no, um, I'm just looking at my settings uh, in the same time. It's just I'm sharing that one window. That's why I think. I okay, it should be here. Mm -hmm. So turning it off, right? Yes, that's right. Typically when you play on your speaker, 
It can't say it's the speaker. So hopefully it will work now. Let me know if you can't hear it. Is it playing? Yes. And can you, can you hear it? it? We can't hear it yet. Maybe you can increase increase the volume a bit to see whether that helps. Yeah. No, we can't hear it. Nope. In the sharing options, can you say share uh, with sound in your screen share where you share the screen? Yes, I'm going to look at it. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. It's something like uh, include computer sound in the share button mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. I think you made in the teams. Uh, so maybe I need to stop sharing. Yeah, and in teams. Sharing again. And then, oh yes, okay, yeah, it's there. I just need to stop sharing first, but um, yeah, it should be okay now. Thank you. So hopefully. Please show me the monkey. The monkey, where is the monkey? You hear it now. Yes, we can hear it. I cannot tell what it is because you are holding it too close to my eyes. Please move it a bit further away from my face. Okay. Well done. I can see the monkey. Well done. Well done. Well done. Please show me the elephant. The elephant. What is the elephant? Oh. Oh. Well done. I can well see done. the elephant. Well done. I can see the monkey. Please show me the elephant. Well done. I can see the elephant. Okay, so um, uh, when uh, analyzing the results, we first of all we we I compared the number of correct actions over total actions by session, and uh, as you can see in this um, figure, basically. Um, the court number of correct actions over total actions was uh, significantly higher in the in the um, sessions, including explanations, uh, compared to the sessions which uh, did not have any in, in, uh, explanations. So compared to the controls, and the same can be seen if you uh, consider the number of mistakes over total actions. You can see that the number of mistakes was significantly lower in. Uh, every single session with uh, with explanations compared to the control sessions. So in conclusions, uh, we could say that the results presented some evidence for um, in favor of the causal explanation sessions because uh, in the ABAB ses sessions in the ABAB group, when the control session was followed by an explanation session, we could see that the um, number of mistakes significantly reduced by the second session when, when the children received explanations for their uh, mistakes and uh, then it further maintained to the session three. Uh, which again did not have any explanations. And then also in the BAB uh, group where children started with the uh, explanation sessions, we could see that their performance some, uh, dropped uh, uh, a little bit for their second session when they didn't receive an explanation, but again they presented a very good reduction of errors uh, for the third session when again they received uh, explanations. Also we could see that this group has significantly better results in kind of correct answers compared to the other group, so when they had two sessions with explanations that further increased uh, the number of correct actions. 
so uh, basically we can uh, conclude that the uh, causal explanation in implementing causal explanation engine in Caspar and Caspar providing explanations for the children help them to improve their visual perspective taking skills. Um, so I also would like to present a, a different study uh, which was done with uh, children with learning disabilities very recently. Uh, and the children with learning disabilities who may or may not have autistic spectrum disorder as well. And uh, this study analyzed whether Caspar could be, and, and first ever really, so this was a feasibility study, whether Caspar could be used for uh, teaching speech and language um, and providing speech and language intervention for children with learning disabilities. Uh, which is important because uh, at, the, at the moment there is approximately 5 million people in the UK and 286,000 children who have learning disabilities and 89% of this population have communication difficulties and need speech and language intervention. Uh, this group commonly have difficulty with understanding speech as well as um, um, having a sufficient vocabulary to express themselves or construct sentences, have difficulties with their fluency, so often they stutter. Um, then they have uh, difficulties with social skills or even maintaining focus and concentration in order to communicate. And uh, later on, if um, children of this population um, don't receive a communication, speech and language therapy, uh, then later in their life it may lead to mental health problems, it may lead to the reduction in their um, opportunities or uh, achieving their potential and then also in participation of employment and then can lead to social isolation. So we thought it would be important to try and provide some help for, uh, you know, for this children. Maybe Caspar could be uh, a good way to do that as well. So in this study, we wanted to analyze whether Caspar uh, could be used to help children with learning disabilities to improve their speech, language and communication skills, and also to see what measurable impact on children with learning disability and so, uh, speech and language communication needs. Uh, of interacting with a humanoid robot. Uh, so for this study, we use the co-creation approach with um, with uh, special needs educational teachers as well as speech and language therapists um, to inform the development of testing uh, uh, and uh, the development of games that we used and developed and then implemented in CASPAR. So uh, we had 20 children from two, two different special educational needs schools, one a primary school and another one a secondary school who took part in this study and uh, who participated in nine sessions with CASPAR over a three weeks period. So in the co-creational phase of, uh, of uh, game design, uh, in this uh, study we first we received um, some information of uh, speech and language communicational targets of uh, pupils at varying levels of complexity uh, from the schools and then we analyzed uh, this, um, these targets uh, by running a frequency analysis and to, to see what kind of speech and language communicational targets are the most common that we could uh, relate to and we could um, design games for with Caspar. So these uh, targets in general were, uh, we could find three more, uh, three most important and most frequent targets where they were related to uh, language comprehension at the most basic level and then to interaction between peers and the engagement in activities and games with each other and then also to language production of course. So we designed three games targeting uh, either one of these uh, speech and language communication goals. The first game was about feeding Caspar, where basically we had some mock uh, fruits and vegetables that, uh, that Caspar asked from the children to cut for them, uh, to cut for uh, Caspar and then to feed to Caspar and uh, the children. Th this was a game for comprehension, so the children needed to understand which fruit or vegetable Caspar is asking for, that uh, the Cas that Caspar wants them to cut the food and to uh, hold close to Caspar's uh, mouth. 
Then the second game was a pointing with Caspar game, which uh, was not only about comprehension, but already about language production. And, and uh, it was also about uh, interaction uh, goals because uh, it involved turn taking uh, between Caspar and the child. So in this game, Caspar asked the child to point to uh, a picture of an animal first, which was in the room. So it was uh, it it um, was it included also comprehension of understanding which animal Caspar asked the child to point at, and then the child was asked to ask Caspar to point to one of the animals, and they were taking turns at uh, in which animal to point to. Then the third game was the tenses with Caspar, which I'm also going to show in a bit more details. Um, in this game, this game was specifically more, more specifically targeting production, but it also included the uh, turn taking and comprehension uh, skills as well. But this game was the highest level regarding uh, language production. In this game, we used some uh, images which we showed on a tablet to the to the children. And uh, these images were about daily activities, for example, uh, walking the dog, uh, cleaning, eating, uh, brushing teeth, such things. And um, so once we, once the experimenter showed a picture to the children, Kaspar asked the child, uh, what is my friend doing today? The friend being on the picture. And then the child uh, needed to provide uh, an answer in a full sentence using um, one of the uh, present tenses, you know, considering that Kaspar asked, what is my friend doing today? So they had to answer either, if, if, if any kind of present tense was acceptable, basically, um, and to, to provide an answer about what's happening on the picture. And then there was another picture and Kaspar asked, what was my friend doing yesterday? So the child needed to provide an answer in any of the past tenses. And then for the next picture, um, Kaspar asked, what will my friend do tomorrow? Um, and uh, the, the child needed to provide an answer in a future tense. So this was about practicing the different tenses and uh, practicing providing and creating full sentences. Um, so uh, we had um, nine pictures in this game and uh, we repeated the game until uh, each tense the child had to provide an answer and uh, create a sentence three times in each tenses. So when we analyzed uh, their performance, we did some video coding. So obviously every single session was video recorded and uh, we coded the first two and the last two sessions out of the nine sessions to see if there was any progress in the comprehension and, um, and um, the production of the language. So we developed the formula for scoring the behavior of the children, and this was based on the certain actions that uh, could happen during the session. For example, in this case, in, in game three, uh, it could happen that the child not, uh, does not produce any sound. So we score that, that um, was defined as a zero. It could also be possible that the child produces unintelligible sounds, which um, uh, would mean um, score one. And then it was also possible that the child produces words with no meaning or with difficulty in the pronunciation, which would be a two. Or, for example, if the child produces the right sentence using the right tense form, that would be a five. So we considered every single possible actions, and then we um, we uh, allocated a certain score for each one of these actions based on their level, and we counted how many times they um, happened during a session. So uh, the formula was basically developed uh, based on these um, uh, based on these two factors: how many times a certain action happened and what level that action was. And uh, so uh, you can see also an example of how it would look like here. So let's say this child in this in this example uh, once produced an unintelligible sound. 
no, no, sorry. So once a uh, child uh, did not produce any sound, and then once uh, produced words with no meaning, uh, also once produced fragmented sentence related to the picture, three times produced the full sentence, and six times produced the right sentence using the right tense form. And so using this formula, we get a score of 3.92 for um, this child and this session. So using this formula, we um, compared the first two and the last uh, two sessions of uh, each child in every single game and uh, the results showed that um, in all four uh, in all three games uh, the children's performance significantly improved from the first two sessions to the last two sessions so uh, to answer our research uh, previously asked research questions, we can uh, we can say that th these interactive games that we use with Casper did make a significant improvement in the children's speech and language um, comprehension and production as well, and um, also had a positive effect on their turn taking, which we know from um, I didn't mention, but we also use some questionnaires that the teachers filled in. So uh, basically, this can um, um, this makes us uh, this suggests that humanoid robots can be uh, used to help children with learning disabilities as well, not only uh, to be used with children with autism, and they can help to improve their speech, language, and communication skills. Um, also, to answer the second research questions, you know, what measurable impact was there? So we can say that the measurable impact on children with learning disability can be seen, uh, especially on the video recordings. So uh, because when we analyzed the videos, we could we could find um, significant differences. So probably the score that we developed would be a good way to go ahead and measure whether certain interventions can help children. Um, in their uh, speech and language skills in the future. Yeah, so um, this is uh, the conclusion of my second study, which I wanted to present to you today. So I think, yeah, that was my last slide. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and any questions. Thank you very Thank much, you very Gabriela. Much, Gabriela. Uh, we uh, have time for a few questions. Uh, who wants to ask the first question, please? Yeah, maybe before I leave, so I just a quick question. So, Casper uh, is uh, obviously is a boy. So uh, yeah. again, this EDI uh -huh. issue. So, is there any rationale behind design use a boy to, to as a as a robot present representation? Yeah. No, we we also have some um, female wigs <laughs> to it, but it it, um, it looked a bit more creepy that way. <laughs> I think oh, because, yeah. you know, okay. the face is a bit more uh, male-like, uh, but no uh, no specific uh, reason for that. It's um, we were we were also considering having it as a female because obviously mm -hmm. it, maybe the one rationale behind could be that more more uh, male children have autistic yeah. autist spectrum disorder yeah, but true, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah because the name also suggests a boy casper <laughs> but anyway so it's, <laughs> thank you for the very interesting talk i'm sorry i have to leave now so see you sometime thank bye you thank, thank you very much yeah. Effie. thank you very much bye. Uh, uh, any further questions yes uh, i think simos is uh, raising his actual physical. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I re raised my physical hand because i'm not sure why i cannot add ah, here it is anyway so thanks, uh, Gabriela. Very, very interesting, and, and the whole team. Very, very interesting uh, project and investigation. So my 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 question is really about how about the long lasting about the long lasting effects of those in, in interventions. So have they where where they stayed and they were enabling the, the, the children to develop more um, active interactions with their with, with other with their companions parents or show more interactive capabilities uh, mm -hmm. through those through those interventions uh, as a you know a, a, a long-term experiment so essentially an, uh, allowing them to develop more long-term autonomy, if we could call it like that. Has there yeah. any such uh, uh, insights been derived? 
Yeah, so um, I, obviously we, we these experiments were not long term as such, but previous case studies did prove that yes, the children do generalize from what they learn and uh, they even take their uh, you know, th their new skills into different scenarios and contexts as well, which was reported by the parents. So previous case studies did prove that that it that, that these interventions do have a longer term effect. For example, um, um, just something that, you know, I just I want to constrain what I say to to published or at least, you know, proved uh, evidence uh, not to my sense of what I can see, but if we uh, consider a, a um, case study from before, there were in which we we were teaching children to recognize emotional expressions on Caspar's face and how to um, behave with others, you know, uh, how to touch a person in order not to hurt them, for example, or to recognize when they are happy. And um, the the parents uh, reported that they, you know, they they said to them uh, out loud, you know, recognizing that ah, you are happy. They they could recognize on the parents' face afterwards that they were happy, even though they could. They they only learned the happy expression on Caspar's face before, so there is a generalization. Also, in this last study, we we did have a pre and post uh, questionnaire, uh, which the teachers filled in, which also showed some improvement that they could recognize in the in the uh, children's communicational behavior. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it, it was not a long term study. It, it was run, you know, a study was run over three weeks, nine sessions. Maybe between the two questionnaires, there were five weeks. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, the, the, the reason that I'm asking that is that I have a, a small toddler, uh, two, two years old, and when we when, when try to, to, to train her a bit with doing, you know, recognizing some some items or pronouncing some items the, if you if you do that over a, you know let's say a week they are able and uh, i assume that there is some some extrapolation can be done for people with disability a loose extrapolation so you need mm -hmm. that you, you you see that this improves and then they can understand pronouns they can they, they are a bit more autonomous but if you leave that aside for a bit for a few weeks and then come back they lose that autonomy Mm. Uh, they, 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 you need to to remind them a bit, you know, or to to nudge them about some of those, uh, let's say, icons or items, and then mm. they, they 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 gain their let's say intelligence again, or they can remind themselves and and they op operate as uh, as before. Yes, I think with uh, speech and language, especially, it is important to have continuous uh, intervention sessions. And yeah, and and in this study we had three uh, interventions a week, so it was quite an intense uh, training for these children. Okay, that's a very very useful, very interesting project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simos, uh, for the question. Uh, are there any further questions? So, yes, uh, Jan, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about the. Um... Like this, this causal, these causal explanations. Uh, when you showed the model of how the causes might relate, or how the, uh, yeah, um, how there were relations between those uh, circles. Uh, sometimes there are multiple uh, possible things that I guess you could uh, generate an explanation from. So, is there any way to rank them, or would you then say everything uh, or all of these? We did rank them. Uh, Hugo, do you want to answer? Because I think this question was uh, more targeted to you. Uh, yeah, so we we defined a rank um, in advance where we thought that, uh, for example, some causes would have priority. I think, for, ex for instance, um, having a blindfold has a priority over the fact that the picture is um, too far away, for example, or too or rotated. Uh, so if so we decided on the rank of priority a priori um, and the causes are ranked uh, based on this rank um, and we only give one explanation at a time so we give one explanation and then see if the child can um, 
recognize the, 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 the issue, uh, given the explanation. And then we, we do the experiment again. Uh, and we see, we try to check whether he realizes what's going on. Uh, for example, if the picture is rotated two or three times, then we realize that the child does not uh, does not comply with, with what the instructions um, are being said. So basically, we rank the explanations on a predetermined rank, and we only give the top explanation and then try the, the, the conduct experiment again. Um, okay. But so all your variables, they, they were Boolean, right? Uh, but how do you make sure that you can evaluate all of them? So how do you, for example, so they're not, if you can't not see all the of them are Boolean, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead please. Uh, so if, if, let's say, the um, the robot or the cameras are not able to even see the picture, then how do you know that the wrong animal was chosen? Oh, uh, so this this is decided by the, the researcher, not by the robot. Ah, so the evaluation, stuff. so all, yeah. everything you have in your model, you know these things. Yeah, it was, it was the researcher who who decides whether the picture is wrong or the picture is rotated. So the researcher who is conducting the experiment uh, selects what kind of what's going on in the model in, in the in the world. Um, for example, he realizes that the, they realize that the child. Um, uh, the picture that the child is holding is the wrong one, and they also realize that the Caspar has a blindfold on. So they select that um, the 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 variables um, and what's wrong with the variables, and then we conduct the and then we build the causal model and then uh, provide the explanations. Yeah. Okay, but I, I guess there are also extensions for uh, well, yeah, there could be some logics where you have unknown things, and then you can still maybe determine causes even though some parts are unknown or. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, an automatic. Uh, although uh, research is always required uh, because we're interacting with child, children, I think Gabriel would be able to. Um, yeah. Talk so about uh, we, that more, but um, yeah. another well, option would be to use some sort of image recognition in the robot itself and make this process uh, more automatic. Okay. Thanks. Yes, and, and just let me know that uh, with Caspar we never intended to, and and really it's it's not our intention ever to make the interaction completely autonomous, simply because um, you know working with uh, with uh, children, really vulnerable children, at, with uh, at different uh, with who have different abilities, different needs, uh, you know it's just impossible to take the human out of the scenario. In the case that a variable is unknown, then we still be able to determine causes and assume if it's unknown, we can't assume that it's a cause. Uh, we assume that it's not cause. Um, as I think so, we have to think on that, but it would be possible anyway, either way. Uh, OK, uh, any other questions? I can ask one more question as well, if you don't mind. So uh, regarding the, the second experiment that you showed about uh, learning uh, process, especially language skills, I guess there is also room for uh, kind of expanding the, the explainability and and, um, and causal explanations to that domain as well. Are you planning for that? Do you see a straightforward path ahead or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but do you think it's, it's as straightforward as the other? Um, uh, perspective taking uh, experiments or I think I think it is yes um, maybe even more so um, because um, yeah for example in if you consider a production uh, language production uh, scenario there are so many things that can be explained in detail and needed to be explained in this study that mm -hmm. that uh, would be I think children would be much more receptive uh, that, to get explanations from Caspar instead of from the researcher. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it could work really good. Yeah, really it would be good. interesting to look at that. Uh, hopefully we will get another project granted and then we can work together. <laughs> good. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Very interesting talk. Uh,